Good morning. Glad you're here this morning. Uh, weather has turned remarkably warmer, uh, which has been a great thing. Uh, last week, uh, we started a three-part Lent series, and I think I called it Advent during my last lesson. <laughs> um, but we're talking about Easter this uh, this spring. Um, and it was based on Lee Strobel's book, A Case, uh, The Case for Easter. And in that book, Strobel... Uh, identified three questions that he thought were critical to the resurrection. And we covered that last Sunday. And that uh, first question was, uh, was Jesus dead after the ordeal on the cross? And we'll continue that questioning uh, today with the second question. Uh, but before we start, let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for the uh, coming spring weather. We appreciate all the flowers and uh, the daffodils and hyacinths poking their heads up through the ground. Uh, we see the leaves starting to uh, break out and uh, leaf buds. It's great being alive and being in your world. Please uh, be with us as we continue to study your word and uh, to revisit um, Easter and the great things that happened during that time thousands of years ago. In thy name we pray. Amen. Well, the lesson, I mean, the uh, question this Sunday is, um, was Jesus' tomb empty on that first Easter morning? Next week, we'll finish up on Easter Sunday with the question, uh, did credible people uh, subsequently encounter Christ after the empty tomb? I want to emphasize that Strubel uh, was an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. Um, he uh, had legal training. He had a degree of master's in studies in law from Yale University. Uh, of the many uh, world religions, only Christianity claims that its founder came back from the dead. Uh, the, the resurrection is a linchpin of our Christian faith. Uh, in seeking uh, the answers to that question, can we rely on that part of our faith? Uh, I think these three questions will answer that for us and give us more confidence in what we believe. Uh, in seeking the answers to these three questions, Strobel went from being an atheist to a Christian. Um, he does use his own logic in the book and in the investigation, however, he does uh, interview and place a lot of credence um, after talking with people uh, well-known in their field, whether they be medical or psychological uh, scholars of history, um, in trying to reach an answer on these three questions. So let's get started on the evidence for a missing body. Uh, we often read about cases um, of missing persons. Oftentimes those are homicides where they suspect that the person has been killed. Uh, we are left with uh, no satisfying answer to seek um, such cases without a body. So often there is a suspect uh, and investigators, investigators work for years to piece together what might have happened. Uh, but rarely, however, uh, do we encounter a case of an empty tomb. The issue wasn't that Jesus was forever missing. It was that he was seen alive first, then he was seen dead, and then he was seen alive again once more. Uh, the empty tomb is an enduring symbol of the resurrection, the ultimate claim that Jesus was God. That's why it's important. The skeptics say that uh, there's really not enough evidence to prove the tomb empty on Easter morning. Uh, other possibilities include, as they might argue, uh, that Joseph of Arimathea was not really a historical, fiction, a historical figure, but a legendary figure, um, that uh, the body was stolen from the tomb, didn't rise from the dead. Uh, the Gospels are contradictory in their description of the empty tomb, which we'll talk about. And therefore, because they're contradictory on what happened Easter morning, they're not reliable. You can't believe them. Uh, the witnesses who observed the empty tomb 
are not trustworthy. So even though they were eyewitnesses, we can't really say that we can believe them. And uh, the other answer is uh, the women went to the wrong tomb, which seems kind of outrageous uh, since they watched the body being buried and uh, Joseph of Arimathea, which I hope to prove, was really a historical figure. So how do we answer these questions? Well, let's start with Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and at one point in the Bible it says that the Sanhedrin were all out, uh, were all present at the time and were out to get Jesus. Uh, we find in other parts of the Gospels that uh, just so happened that Joseph of Arimathea was not present when that vote took place, if, if there was a vote. Um, I, I like to uh, go to two scripture references this morning to talk about the, this particular thing. And, uh, and the first one is in Matthew uh, chapter 27, verse 57. Um, at evening time, a rich man from Arimathea arrived. His name was Joseph. And he had become a disciple of Jesus. And he went to Pilate, and he asked to be given Jesus' body. Pilate assented, ordered his servants to turn Jesus' body over to Joseph. So Joseph took the body, wrapped Jesus in a clean sheet of white linen, and laid Jesus in a new tomb, which had been carved from a rock. Then he rolled a great stone in front of the tomb's opening, and he went away. We find a similar story with a little bit more detail in Luke uh, chapter 23, um, verse 50. Meanwhile, a man named Joseph had been at work. He was a member of the council, the Sanhedrin, a good and fair man from a Judean town called Arimathea. He had objected to the plans and actions of the council. He was seeking the kingdom of God. He had gone to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. He removed the body from the cross and wrapped it in a shroud made of fine linen. He then laid the body in a cave-like tomb cut from solid rock, a tomb that had never been used before. It was preparation day, the day before the Holy Sabbath, and it was about to begin at sundown. The women who had accompanied Jesus from the beginning in Galilee now came, took note of where the tomb was and how his body had been prepared then left to prepare spices and ointments for his proper burial. They ceased their work on the Sabbath so that they could rest as the Hebrew scriptures required. Well, the Christians' anger at the Sanhedrin and members of the Sanhedrin for instigating Jesus' crucifixion, um, you know, it's highly unlikely that Christians then would have uh, invented a member of the Sanhedrin uh, to take the body of Christ and bury him uh, because the people, the, the Christians themselves, could have checked this out at the time of the gospel writing. So I, I don't think that it's uh, unlikely or um, a guess to say that Joseph of Arimathea was a historical figure. He, in fact, took the body of Christ and put him in a tomb. Um, much of our confidence for this analysis comes, this analysis of the tomb and Christ being buried and then having an empty tomb actually comes from an ancient creed um, recorded in one of Paul's uh, letters. And, and so for this, I'd like to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this is important. Uh, first of all, 1 Corinthians was one of Paul's early books, and he quotes this creed, much like the Apostles' Creed, to us. He, he quotes this creed in the scripture, and he makes it clear that he got this from other Christians. He didn't write it. He didn't get it from God. He got it from other Christians who were reciting this creed at the time. Um, so let me read it, and then we'll talk about it. So I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'll start at the beginning of the chapter. <clears throat> let me remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I preached to you when we first met. It's the essential message that you have taken to heart, <clears throat> the central story you now based your life on. And throughout this gospel, you are liberty, liberated, unless, of course, your faith has come to nothing. Okay, here's the creed coming up. 
For I pass down to you the crux of it all, which I have also received from others, that, and here's the creed, that the anointed one, the liberating king, died for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead on the third day. So that scripture, that creed, was something that people, the early Christians, repeated to themselves. So they must have actually been repeating what took place in much the same way that we repeat the, the, the Apostles' Creed about what we believe. Let me finish this. Since all this happened to fulfill the scriptures, it was the perfect climax to God's covenant story. Afterward, he appeared alive to Cephas. You may know him as Simon Peter. Then to the rest of the twelve. If that were not amazing enough, on one occasion, he appeared to more than 500 believers at one time. Many of those brothers and sisters are still around to tell the story, though some have fallen asleep in Jesus, meaning they had passed away. Soon he appeared to James, his brother and leader of the Jerusalem church, and then to all, and then to all the rest of the emissaries he himself commissioned. Last of all, he appeared to me. Um, so, as I mentioned, Paul was not the architect of this creed that said Jesus was crucified, died, buried, and rose again on the third day. Um, the Greek words he uses, as I read in this particular translation of the voice, indicates that he was receiving it from other Christians and transmitting it to the readers of his letter. Uh, like the Apostles' Creed, which we repeat today, this creed specified what the earliest Christians believed as part of their faith. Uh, Mark, the earliest gospel, attests to the burial story. Uh, the gospels provide multiple independent attestations of the burial story. Joseph of Arimathea is mentioned in all four of the gospels. The buried story in Mark is so early that it was simply not possible for people to inject legendary comments about what actually took place on that Easter morning. And so let's go to the book of Mark. This is the earliest of the Gospels. Uh, you realize that um, as an event, as you get farther and farther from an event, in this case, uh, the life, death, burial, resurrection of Christ, uh, things get injected into the story. And so I'll use the word legendary several times, legendary as opposed to truth, uh, conjecture as opposed to witness and fact. Um, if you get close to the story, the documents that are written at those times are likely to be accurate. They are likely to tell the real story. And the farther away you get from the story, the more likely people are to inject things that were not actually there, maybe that they wished were there, that uh, were not part of the eyewitness account. Um, so let's, uh, let's read Mark 15, um, and we'll start at verse 44, and we'll go into uh, chapter 16. Pilate could not believe that Jesus was already dead. So he sent for the centurion who confirmed it. Then Pilate gave Joseph permission to take the body. Joseph had the body wrapped in a linen burial cloth he had purchased and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. Then he had a stone rolled over the opening and sealed it. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Jesus were watching as the body was interred. At the rising of the sun, after the Sabbath on the first day of the week, the two Marys and Salome uh, brought sweet-smelling spices. So you understand, it was uh, the evening before the Sabbath, so there was no work on the Sabbath, so they quickly buried Jesus, but they were not able to complete the burial process. So this is on Sunday. After the Sabbath, the women come back to the tomb in order to complete that burial process. These two women brought sweet-smelling spices they had purchased to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. Along the way, they wondered to themselves how they would roll the heavy stone away from the opening. But when they arrived, the stone had already been rolled away in spite of its weight and size. Stepping through the opening, they were startled to see a young man in a white robe seated inside and to the right. Don't be afraid, 
he said. You come seeking Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified. He is gone. He is risen. See the place where his body lay. Go back and tell Peter and his disciples that he goes before you into Galilee, just as he said. You will see him there when you arrive. We're going to come back to that story again, I think, at the end. It's, it's the simplest of the four Gospels, uh, but it's straight to the point, and it is the earliest of the four Gospels to tell that story. Let's ask another question in order to determine whether or not the tomb was robbed, perhaps. Um, how secure was the tomb? Well, we know from archaeological evidence that a tomb of this nature that's carved into the rock had a low entrance, uh, slanted below a groove on which a large stone was in, and after the tomb was ready to be sealed, the stone was rolled down a slight incline over the, over the opening to the tomb, and then it was sealed. It only took a, a single person to roll the stone down, but to roll the stone out of the way would have taken several people. Uh, there's a question about the guards at the tomb. Only Matthew reports guards at the tomb. And for that, we'll go to Matthew 27. It's instructive to talk about this. Um, I'm in Matthew 27, verse uh, 62. The next day, which is the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and Pharisees came, went together to Pilate. They reminded him that when Jesus was alive, he had claimed that he would be raised from the dead after three days. So please order someone, the chief priests and scribes say to Pilate, so please order someone to secure the tomb for at least three days. Otherwise, his disciples might sneak in and steal his body away and then claim he had been raised from the dead. If that happens, then we would have been better off just leaving him alive. You have a guard, Pilate said. Go and secure the grave. So they went to the tomb, sealed the, the stone in its mouth, and left the guard to keep watch. Um, I think this is probably historical, the fact that uh, there were guards put in place. That uh, Think of this scenario. Uh, let's say that um, there had been no guards. Uh, the Jewish leaders could have said... Um, the disciples came and stole a body, at which time the Christians would have responded, the guards would have prevented a theft. The leaders would have said then, guards, are you crazy? There are no guards. So I, I don't think, uh, I think it's logical to assume that guards were put in place, that the, that the leaders um, did expect or wanted to prevent his followers from uh, stealing the body. Uh, so I think the tomb was secured, and the guards were there uh, to protect some untoward incident other than Christ arising himself from the dead at the hand of God. Um, what about the contradictions that people say occurred in the four Gospels that uh, took place on the morning that the tomb was found empty? Uh, because there were so many contradictions, the critics say that uh, the empty tomb story is not credible. Um, for example, uh, Matthew says that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary visit the tomb. Uh, an earthquake occurs and uh, an angel rolls back the stone. In Mark, uh, it says the women arrive at the tomb at sunrise and the stone has already been rolled back. And in Luke, uh, the women arrive at early dawn and the stone is rolled back. Um, in Matthew, for example, an angel is sitting inside the tomb. In Mark, it's a youth. And in Luke, there are two men. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, name different women going to the tomb. Uh, the response from the women on seeing the empty tomb is different in the Synoptic Gospels. And then you roll in John, the fourth gospel, um, which conflicts with much of the story in the other three synoptic gospels. So, so how do we reconcile these discrepancies? Well, uh, how many times have you heard two witnesses at a trial uh, seeing the same crime and describe the scene exactly the same? Or do they describe it differently? 
most often is described differently. If it's described the same, then you would suspect that there was collusion and collaboration. Uh, when you question your kids about an event took place, what's the first thing you think about if the kids have exactly the same story? It's the fact that they probably talked about it beforehand. So an incident such as this, I think you can expect different stories from different people. Um, despite the differences written by the four authors, uh, not all of whom, by the way, were eyewitnesses, uh, the the core of the story remains the same. Uh, Jesus was buried in a tomb, and a small group of women visit the tomb early Sunday morning and find the tomb empty. And that's what I think we need to hang our hats on. Um, let's ask the question, are these witnesses, these women who uh, observed the empty tomb first, are they reliable? Uh, since they were friends and relatives of Jesus, and were they objective observers? And the fact that they are women, does that make them suspect? Well, we've talked about this before. Women in the first century uh, were very low on the social status. One of the prayers uh, uttered by Jewish men was the fact that, thank God I am not a woman. Um, they weren't allowed to be legal witnesses in a Jewish court of law. They were low on the social ladder. In this light, don't you find it remarkable that the writers portrayed women as the first chief witnesses to the empty tomb? Well, if this were a legend and you were a Jewish man at the time, what you would do is you would change the men who were witnesses to the empty tomb, change the people to, who were witnesses to the empty tomb. You'd change them to men. But it's not. It's women. And so this makes it I think, a truthful story. Um, I think that the Gospel writers faithfully recorded what actually happened. It speaks to the historical accuracy of the event rather than a legendary status. So let's uh, think about this. What, what are the reasons we should believe that the empty tomb was an historical fact? Um, the empty tomb is implicit in the early traditions of Christianity, so much so that it was passed on to us in the first Corinthian creed that we just read in Paul's letter. It was a historical fact, and it, it was a, a tenet of the belief of the early Christians that Christ was died, he was buried, and he arose again. It's very old and a very reliable source of information because it was written so closely to the event. The site of Jesus' tomb was known to Christians and Jews alike. Um, if it weren't really empty, it would have been impossible for a movement to be founded uh, in a belief of a resurrection in the same city <clears throat> where this man was probably executed and buried. Uh, if it wasn't empty, a lot of men died for their belief for no reason at all. Uh, we can tell from the language and the grammar and the style that Mark uh, had about his writing and in this story, including the tomb story, that he got it actually from an earlier source, that he didn't write it himself, but he copied and wrote about what he read back then. Uh, there's some evidence that scholars believe this early, and it's called a Q document, this early document could have been written as early as 37 AD. That's, that's just several years, uh, half a dozen years after we suspect that Christ was uh, placed on the cross. That's way too early for legend to interject uh, untruth and legendary comments uh, into this uh, early source um, to have ser seriously corrupted it. The bottom line is that the story of Mark is so close to the actual event, it has to be true. If it weren't true, the opponents of Christianity uh, would have refuted it. And the group of believers would never have succeeded in establishing a church under that kind of persecution. Um, there's real simplicity in the empty tomb story in Mark. 
Um, later accounts, uh, as we get farther away, not necessarily part of our Bible, a part of our canon, uh, they interject all kind of flowery narratives that speak to legendary things that are not really factual or things that we find hard to believe. I like to really go back and and read Mark again uh, and listen to the simple truth of what Mark tells us. And so I'm in uh, Mark again, this time chapter 16, same verses we read before, starting at verse 1. At the rising of the sun, after the Sabbath on the first day of the week, the two Marys and Salome brought sweet-smelling spices they had purchased to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. Along the way, they wondered to themselves how they would roll the heavy stone away from the opening. But when they arrived, the stone was already rolled away in spite of its weight and size. Stepping through the opening, they were startled to see a young man in a white robe seated inside and to the right. The man in white said, Don't be afraid. You come seeking Jesus of Nazareth, the one who was crucified. He is gone. He is risen. See the place where his body laid. Go back and tell Peter and his disciples that he goes before you into Galilee, just as he said, and you will see him there when you arrive. Um, the unanimous testimony of the empty tomb by women uh, argues for the authenticity of the story. Uh, this would have been embarrassing for the disciples, the fact that women were first there and they were counted as witnesses. The low person on the social ladder, the person who could not serve as a witness in a Jewish court of law, uh, why would they have put such an embarrassing thing in if it were not true? They could have interjected false stories into this by saying it was a man that came to the story, or came to the tomb. So it was embarrassing for the disciples to admit that it was the women that uh, saw the empty tomb first and they would have been inclined uh, to cover it up uh, but that never would have held uh, as truth to the early Christians. They would have refuted it uh, if they had tried to uh, cover it up. Uh, the earliest Jewish attacks on Christianity assume an empty tomb. You notice that nothing that we read says that <clears throat> um, the tomb was still had a body in it. They all assume that the tomb was empty. Um, no one claimed the tomb uh, still claimed Christ's body. They all tried to explain why there was no body in the tomb. Uh, they tried to explain that the guards fell asleep. Why? Because they knew that the tomb was vacant. The disciples had no motive to steal the body and then die for a lie. If they stole the body, they would have known that there was not a resurrection from the dead. So why would they go out and preach that and die as martyrs for that reason? Certainly, the Jewish leaders would not have removed the body and give credence to the resurrection. So the only conclusion that I can reach, and the same conclusion that Lee Strobel uh, reached, was on that Easter morning, the tomb was empty. Christ was gone. The body was not stolen. It was not the wrong tomb that the women went to. They saw the body laid in the tomb. And so as a basic tenet in our faith, we can attest to today that the tomb was, in fact, empty on that Easter morning. Everyone in the ancient world admitted that the tomb was empty. The issue was not uh, the issue was then, how did it get that way? Uh, and next week, we'll answer that question when we talk about who were, the, who were the people that witnessed Christ alive after the empty tomb, and were they credible? I, I think it's a great, uh, great lesson for us. Uh, remember, last week, we uh, showed that uh, Christ died on the cross. He was dead when he was put in the tomb in the Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And on Easter morning, when the women went by, the tomb was empty. Even the Jewish leaders don't uh, disagree with the fact that the tomb was empty. They were trying to reach other explanations. And now 
that Christ had died and Christ was no longer in tomb, did he become alive? Were there people who saw him alive? And so tune in next Sunday and we'll talk about that. Let's bow our heads. Our Father God, thank you for the lesson today. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for our sins, to be buried, and to rise again, that we might have hope for the same. Be with us now and throughout the rest of the week, and bring us back safely again here next Sunday. In thy name we pray. Amen. Have a great week.